Well, welcome back, class, to Lesson 4 of Old Testament Survey 3, the Book of the Writings from Chaplain's College, School of Ministry. This week we're going to be looking at just two books, relatively small ones, but with quite a bit of illustration of God's sovereignty, and they're also from two very different periods of Jewish history. We'll be looking at the books of Ruth and the book of Esther. we look at our lesson outline, we'll see that this is Lesson 4, titled Writings About Women, Ruth and Esther. Interesting now that if we look at this in this lineup here, we see down at uh, Lesson 7, we talk about Ezra and Nehemiah. Actually, uh, Esther, out of this study, will have some ties to Ezra and Nehemiah. And we also have, with through Ruth, ties back to the Book of Judges from our previous semester studies. Now let's get right into the into looking at the the books. First is just kind of a generic overlook at both of them. Uh, these are the only two books with women as the central characters, and they're the only two books of the Bible that are actually named after women. Now, let's say women haven't been figuring prominently in other parts of the Bible, but these are the only ones that are where they are the central character and the books named after them. Obviously, you know we've got you know Deborah who was a judge was mentioned back in the book of Judges, but it wasn't just all about her. It was just, that was about the whole book of the, you know, Judges, that whole period. And as we get into the, the New Testament, obviously we got a lot of important women there. And Mary, kind of an important part. We just celebrated Christmas. Then you get Mary and Martha mentioned quite a lot, and a lot in the early church where women played a big role, a lot of supporting roles. You might not see a, too much, but you, as you read about it, you, you catch the names here and there and find out they were doing a lot of the support functions and providing a lot of the money for the early disciples, you know, to to keep this this thing going. So there was a lot of women involved, but just not where they were the central characters. Now if we look at the two main characters here, briefly we look we see Ruth. She was a Moabite woman who displayed great faith and loyalty. Uh, you might recall that Moab is a longtime enemy of Israel. They had trouble going through there through the Exodus. <clears throat> they were neighbors, but not very good neighbors. And this occurs basically during the time of the judges. So we're going kind of way back, you know, back into the history, right at the beginning of our last semester, basically in the in the timeline here to get get into Ruth. And then we look at Esther. She was a Jewish woman in Persia. She displays a lot of great courage, a lot of courage to save the Jews. Of course, she was Jewish, but she originally wasn't, you know, letting that be known. But she came to a point where she had to choose between what was going on and her Jewish and revealing her Jewish heritage. This actually occurs during the time of the return from the Babylonian captivity, which was now turned into the Persian reign after the Persians had conquered Babylon, and this was between like the first and second return that we see going on where the people are starting to come back to Jerusalem. But a lot of the Jews, as we looked at before, actually stayed back in the you know Babylonian and Persian empires because they'd, made, they'd established lives there. And apparently this is the case here with, with Esther and, and Mordecai. So first we'll look at the book of Ruth. I've titled this, you know, Faith and Loyalty. Kind of the things that, that she really identifies with here. Uh, one big thing I want to point out that <clears throat> was pointed out in your text, but is that Ruth is specifically mentioned in the ancestral line in Matthew 1 where they trace way back from the beginning all the way up to the, the time of Jesus through that history. And it's actually starting at verse 5. You see... Solomon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. And there we have that specific mention of this Moabite woman in the line of Jesus. And then we say Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. A couple of things I want to note here. First, you see another woman mentioned here, Rahab. If you recall, she was the prostitute that helped the spies get into the city. 
when they were checking it out before they they <clears throat> went in and, and conquered it. She gave great help to it, and she actually converted, and we can see married, you know, <laughs> she was the mother of Boaz, who we see later in this story. Then we see Ruth. If you look at this, that basically means, if I'm getting my <clears throat> ancestry names correct here, that she's actually the great-grandmother of King David. Now again, we can look at what's going on here in this thing. You know, see, take a look, you know, we see Naomi here, who starts off as kind of the, the focus because it was, you know, she, her who lost her husband and her two sons after they had had to move out of Bethlehem and over into the land of Moab because of a, a famine. And as we see it, you know, it looks like she kind of lost faith. And we have to kind of take that to some extent because it was obviously she had a lot of faith early on in the way she conducted herself because that's what won Ruth over. It was the way Naomi con conducted herself that draw drew Ruth to then adopt Judaism to go over to her mother-in-law's faith because Moab was definitely you know a bunch of pagan worshipers so even though it you know, looks like she'd given up hope i mean naomi even went to the point of wanting her name changed you know to indicate her her condition and sorrow and whatever but her early on display of her faith was enough to win over ruth and then ruth kind of in, seemed to carry on then from there being the strength that naomi needed then to keep her going so one strength helped you know each other as they at various times but then ruth we see how her, you know she remains faithful you know to naomi and then also to her adopted religion then we also illustrate you know that God always planned to include the Gentiles in his plan of redemption first we see this you know in Ruth's conversion obviously she's Moab Moabite you know, which was an enemy the Gentile she wasn't a Jew but she converted so that was you know allowed we still see, we see that at other times through throughout you know the Old Testament where others that you know come you know proselyte Jews they weren't allowed to have the full participation, maybe, that some of, you know, that the bloodline Jews were allowed to have, but they were allowed to participate in the ceremonies and were considered Jews. And the second we see here of God's intent to include the Gentiles is, you know, Boaz's redemption of Ruth. I'm going to get it a little bit later, more about this kinsman relationship thing, but there's kinsman redeemer thing but it's we see here that you know it's an illustration of god's plan and kind of a foreshadowing of what's going to be coming through jesus as we go through the story we we see him mentioning a fair amount of time spent on you know how ruth is out gleaning in the fields just to mention you know that this was a provision for the poor that was built into the law way back when and it's basically you know God's way of showing his concern for the poor and the and the homeless something that you know that all of you guys do when you're working with the motel ministry and in another way it's kind of a thing of uh, <clears throat> there has to be a little involvement it's not like it's just okay here's some food it's like they have to go out and actually glean it themselves which I think is kind of a, an inspiration for part of also what's being done in the motel ministry is that we try to get the people that were out there to help to get involved. Initially, maybe we go out and do a lot of the stuff with our volunteers, but as we grow and grow, we get them, get the, the guests more involved. So the obvious thing is for them to become, you know, their own church to take it over completely. And I think that's kind of, you know, derived from this idea of gleaning where we just get them involved in it. 
And you also might recall, you know, that Jesus and his disciples, you know, appeared to be out gleaning in the fields when the Pharisees questioned them about working on the Sabbath. So it's something that, you know, <laughs> even Jesus was out gleaning at times. Because the disciples and all that, they, they didn't necessarily have a great amount of provision. Again, this is another case where if you, as you read through the New Testament, you'll find out that a lot of the women were involved in providing, you know, the provisions for the disciples and that little entourage as they moved around throughout the throughout the land. Then we look at this kinsman redeemer concept. That was also built into Jewish law. It was there to ensure the continuation of the line. It's basically if a brother died and, you know, they had no son, then there was this whole line of succession about who was supposed to then marry the widow. Specifically told that, you know, they need to bear us, have, you know, have a son who will then be raised in the name of the one that was that had died so that his share of the land will not be lost so it was built in as part of you know the, the laws of passing down the land and you know, it was also considered a bad thing to have your name be cut off so it was to keep the name going also there was a whole order of responsibility and we kind of see that coming into account here when boaz first has to go to his older brother because the line of responsibility starts with, you know, the oldest brother to whoever it was that had died. And then if they're unable or unwilling to do the redemption, then it goes down and with the next brother. And then, it, you know, if there's if no brothers or whatever are there, then it goes down, you know, the uncles and cousins. And there's a, it goes down to a lot of detail, really, into how how the, the line of succession is taken care of. Uh, the other thing, it is subject to you know, all the other laws of marriage and all the other laws. You can't violate one law to, to, to satisfy another. There are some people that you know wonder about, oh, you know, isn't there some problem there? You know, with somebody being already married and say, well, that's part of the thing. You can't. It's got to be the, the marriage has to be legal according to Jewish law before it can be done. And of course. You know, this is again another foreshadowing of Jesus, you know, who's the ultimate kinsman redeemer. He's a kinsman, he was born into uh, you know, into us. So he's human just like us, but he's also God, and as God he's our our savior and our redeemer. He paid for our sins. It's the ultimate redemption, you know, here in the in Boaz, you know, it's the redemption of the, the name and the land and redeems Ruth and all that and it's very much you know rooted in this world whereas jesus you know his redemption is rooted in our our eternity he redeems us from our sins redeems us from the penalty that we would normally pay of death and he also as we look at you know <laughs> into the future looking like into what's going on in revelation he redeems the whole earth too <laughs> so he not only you know follows the redeeming of us like boaz redeeming Ruth, but he also redeems the land in returning earth to being under his complete domination instead of right now whether it's where he's given Satan a little bit of rain on the earth. Eventually, of course, Satan's going to lose and God's going to redeem us and the land. And of course, eventually there'll be a whole new heaven and a whole new earth, but now we're getting into a couple semesters from now, so. But this Ruth, you know, it, it's a, a nice little story, and it gives a lot of illustrations of, and foreshadowing of what's going to be coming up in Jesus' life. So now we'll move on to Esther. Now that I've just kind of headlined his courage and faithfulness just because of what she did and the story we see all the way through here. So we see that Mordecai and Esther were Jews living in the capital of the now Persian Empire after Persia conquered Babylon. Mordecai, I believe, was a cousin. Actually, Esther's father had died, so Mordecai <coughs> was taking care of her. And again, almost a, another illustration of this kinsman-redeemer concept where a relative was taking care of one because somebody had died. One of the other characters we see here was Haman, the arch enemy in this particular story, and he was descended from the Amalekites, the group that was supposed to have been eliminated by Saul way back when. 
And it appears, although it's not specifically mentioned, but just from the way things go in this in this story, it appears that both Mordecai and Haman were pretty well aware of the bad blood and etc. between the Amalekites and the Jews. And one thing you hear about the story when people try to question about whether this book should be in the Bible or what's going on here, but they say, oh, well, God's not even mentioned in this book. Why is it even in here? <clears throat> well, even though God's not specifically mentioned in the book, it's obvious that it's his providential influence that puts Esther and Mordecai into the position to prevent another attempt to destroy the Jewish nation. <clears throat> you know, even when we look at the books, you know, all the other books where God is mentioned, you see the instances where God is putting people into position to be able to carry out his plan. So even though God's not specifically mentioned here, we see that same concept being put into action here where it's through God's providential influence on the way things go on in the world that people are in the right place at the right time to do what's needed. We look at now what was going on actually in the story. Esther basically was brought into a choice where she had to make a choice between her security and comfort as queen and her Jewish heritage, you know, and this was at the risk of her life. You gotta remember that this king here is Xerxes uses the the Hebrew name in the in the actual book and his other, you know, his Persian name was another big long kind of weird sounding thing. But this was Xerxes, which was the Greek Greek version. You hear about Xerxes in a lot of areas. Like most kings in this time, he was not, you know, the most the nicest guy at times. And we just saw that, you know, when his first queen didn't do what he wanted, she was taken out of the picture. So it's not like, you know, it's a, a, a veiled threat or anything. It's, you know, this guy could be a bad dude when he wanted to be a bad dude. But we look at this, you know, where she's making a choice. And you know, how many times do we see throughout the Bible and, you know, even in our time right now, where people have been asked, they've come to a point where they actually have to make a choice, you know, whether it's going to be between their, their own security and following God's plan, you know, at the risk. They have to trust then that God is going to protect them in one way or another. You know, he's either going to get them through it or if they're going to be killed, then they know that God will, you know, bring them into heaven. But one way or another, God's going to take care of them. Now we look at this and we see that, you know, Haman had actually tricked King Xerxes into giving a directive to allow the execution of the Jews to occur on a specific day and the plundering of their property. And one of the things that you have to know here is that because this was an edict of the Persian king, the way the Persian laws were written, that once an edict of the king has been sent forth, it cannot be revoked. So that's an important part of this. But we see here, this is, you know, just an, another attempt to eliminate the Jews. And we've seen this throughout history. You know, they're always trying to do it, you know, whether it's, you know, the Pharaoh chasing them down after he released them. You know, everybody seems like they're trying to do it. And it's going on through history now. We still see it. We saw it through in the Holocaust. We're seeing it now. Well, there are still groups out there that want to eliminate the Jews from the planet. Well, to get around the problem of the <clears throat> irrevocable edict, Mordecai and Esther, you know, had a degree, another decree issued by Xerxes that basically just allowed the Jews to defend themselves. Normally that wouldn't have been allowed because they were still a subject people, even though, they, you know, we're looking now at the time when they're being allowed to return to Jerusalem, but they're still under the rule of, of Persia. So Esther, you know, she gets into this position because she's beautiful. God puts her into that position. Mordecai had been involved with the, the, the government to some extent because we see one of the things they do eventually is, you know, they read the thing that says where Mordecai had been a big help to the, to the Persian government. 
another case where we see, you know, like Daniel, who we're going to look at next week, you know, people were brought out of Jerusalem and Israel during the captivity were then placed into high-ranking positions in the government of the conquerors. So I don't know how exactly how high he was, but he obviously had been providing some help. But that gave him the inroads to bring Esther in when Xerxes was hunting for a new queen. And then, of course, God used his influence there to <laughs> say, you know, hey, look how beautiful, you know, this girl is Xerxes. This is somebody you really ought to consider as queen. And so that then put Esther in the position where then she could finally choose to reveal her Jewish heritage and get this edict that would uh, then save the Jews from the annihilation that Haman had planned. And of course, by allowing them to defend themselves, what actually took place is that a lot of the descendants of the Malachites were wiped out, completing what should have been done a lot earlier by Saul. This is really just another illustration, I think, of God using ordinary people to do extraordinary things to further the progress of his plan. You know, we've seen it all throughout the Bible, and we see it now. Has always been his plan is to use ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And that's really what you guys are doing with the motel ministry. Just out there doing our best, trying to get God's word spread, bring these people that we are out there initially to serve up to the point where they are then serving themselves and then serving others, keeping on this this whole legacy of ordinary people doing extraordinary things because of what God does in their lives, either putting them in the right positions to have influence or doing great things themselves, inspiring others to do great things, whatever it may be. But all through history, and especially in this book here of Esther, we see where God is using things behind, doing things behind the scenes to put people in the right position to accomplish his purpose. You know, if he hadn't put Mordecai and Esther in this position, then there was a good chance, you know, that the Jews could have been eliminated. Although we also notice in here that Mordecai does say, you know, to Esther, hey, if you choose not to do this, God's got, he's got a backup plan, but you're not going to like the results of it. So we have to keep that in mind, too, that, you know, sometimes we have to look out for, you know, if we don't fit in with God's plan, we also have to uh, look at the consequences. So for an outside-the-class group discussion, I'd like you guys just to talk with various people as you get a chance you know, about how the faith and loyalty of Ruth and the courage and faithfulness of Esther apply to our life and you know, our ministry. As we see, you know, how Ruth was, you know, faithful to this new new religion that she had adopted, you know, the, by converting over to Judaism and her loyalty to her mother-in-law. You know, how does that affect our lives and how does that affect how we go about our ministry? Then we look at Esther, you know, how she was put in a position to where she had to choose between I mean, she was queen. She had, she, had, she had it made, but she had to take a risk in order to do God's will. And how often do we, are we asked to do something like that? Maybe not on that big a scale, maybe not to the point of peril of our own lives, but we're asked to do something because God has put us in a position to do it, and it might affect some of our, our comfort or our wealth or our position, our job, who knows what it affects? Discuss this with some of the, the people you work with. And if you see each other, you know, during the time, you know, discuss this too. And then if anything really interesting comes up as you're doing this discussion, then you can report it the next time we meet. And this is it for this lesson. We'll see you at the next one. And have a great week and a great ministry.